My name is Rajendra Pawar. I'm the founder and chairman of NIIT Limited, which just completed 41 years. Anyone who came of the age in the 1990s would surely recall the dominance that NIIT had in the education system. If you were not lucky enough to get into a reputed engineering college but wanted to make a career in IT, then NIIT was the next best option for you. In a way, NIIT built India's IT powerhouse stature and is the giant on whose shoulders many of today's startups stand. In this episode of the Founder Thesis Podcast, Rajendra Pawar, the co-founder and chairman of NIIT, talks with your host Akshay Dath about his multi-decade journey of building NIIT as the OG edtech startup of India, taking it to a public listing and making NIIT into the truly global trading platform that it is today. This is a conversation packed with the kind of insights that take decades to learn and will help founders to build a truly long-term vision and focus on customers first. Stay tuned for the conversation and subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming app to learn about creating organizations that are built to last. Well, we created NIT in 1981. That was, as is characteristically called, the closed economy, pre-liberalization, a whole decade before liberalization. So passing out from IIT Delhi, quite obviously, we didn't have the the pre-placement talks or in-campus placement. I remember in my year, only two companies came. So the idea that time was you finish your degree and then start looking for a job, which is what I did, and joined LNT. So 72, I joined LNT. That was soon from there to DCM as a management trainee, which was very useful. And those were sought after, very difficult to get into jobs. And then a few years down the line, I joined HCL. In 76, I joined HCL, which was the entrepreneurial company for manufacturing computers that time, which had been set up by a senior of mine from DCM, Shiv Nader. But I joined a year after they set it up, so four years there. And then while at HCL, you know, I had we had the luxury in those days as a young company to choose my title. So And, the, and I said, okay, I'll be corporate planning manager. I, I wanted to see how planning gets done, how we integrate all the functions of management. Because as somebody starting up a regional operation, I saw so many misses pieces. And we had to work directly with the research group and we had to work with the marketing team. So I said, shouldn't we be a little more organized? Shouldn't our planning be a little more organized? So I chose to come into head office and and set up the office of corporate planning, which actually involved right from thinking about the new product, talking to marketing, getting input, then talking to the research group, talking to the software teams, and therefore creating, we created the first um, 16-bit microprocessor-based disk-based computer in the country. So I had the opportunity to work in the center of all the functions that were going on. And while doing that, actually, I was reading extensively as I was looking at what's happening all over the world, traveling to conferences on computers. It used to be something called the National Computing Conference, NCC of US. That used to be the big event, well before whatever else happened. And so the opportunity of the world computerizing was very obvious. The pace of it was obvious, and particularly for India, which was still kind of a closed economy, the promise of computers making a big difference was huge. And sitting in the corporate planning function, looking at you know the usual strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and the formats of how do we plan, it was becoming very clear that while the demand for computers would be very high, the constraint would be the people who have to program, the people who have to drive computers, the people who have to use computers. And not only that, even the chairman of the board of companies, you know, had the question, what do I do with computers? So the gap of understanding what to do with computers and the absolute absence of skills, to me, was appearing as something which will constrain the growth of the company. And, uh, you know, threats are uh, opportunities are in disguise. So this constraints are opportunities, challenges are opportunities in disguise. So that was the genesis to say, well, if this is such a constraint to the growth of the IT industry, then shouldn't one do something about it? You have to, it can block the growth. And I think that was the germ of the idea. And so we set it up and we did rent, not a garage, but there was a small consulting firm, which also was someone we knew. So we used a part of their office for a few months before we rented a place in Delhi. So initially, I had to find a partner 
and uh, so my batchmate Vijay Thadani, IIT Delhi, who was who had joined the Tatas, he had worked in Nelco with Mr. Ratan Tata briefly before he went to join Keltron. The Kerala State Electronic Corporation, which was into power management, power systems, and distribution, and power control. When I was in Bombay in HCL, he was running the Keltron operation for Western India. So we caught up after a few years, almost five years after passing out. And we used to just compare notes. And then I moved to Delhi in 79. And when I was thinking about this idea in 81, then I told him that I said, Look, this is what I'm thinking about. So would you? give up your job and come. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll come and we'll start something, whatever. I've taken a look at the role of technology in learning because it was very clear that if there aren't people in this field who will work on computers, they're not going to be teachers who can teach these people. I mean, the, the root is, you know, where is the fountainhead? Where are the teachers who will train these people that they didn't exist? And those few who were there had been pulled away by the large computer companies, a handful of computer companies then. So the question really was, if you have to solve this problem at scale, we will have to lean on technology. As, as engineers, we were thinking about that. And I'd had the exposure in these conferences to take a look at the role of video in learning, video-assisted instruction, as it was called. And I had experimented with that in 81 itself. So anyway, it's a long story of how we conceptualized the pedagogy. But basically, we launched in 82. The company was found December 81, 2nd December. And by then, Vijay had had to leave Keltron and join. And we decided we'd set up the first operation in Bombay being the center of everything, all commercial activity. And Vijay was located in Bombay. I had, I had moved to Delhi. And then we, the, the third important person to join us was a junior of ours from IIT who I didn't know but who was working in Keltron with Vijay. He's two years junior. That is Mr. Rajendran. Raju as we call him. So Vijay motivated Raju to say, look, you'll probably have to now. And he was posted on a Keltron project in and so we got him to be in Bombay for some time. And our idea was that we would do Bombay and Delhi and Chennai as a third place. And so the idea was that he would move to that place whenever we set it up. Because in the, in the course of 82, we started in Bombay, then Delhi, and then Chennai. How did you find the three cities? You know, every city would need you to rent. Rent meant some upfront security deposit and all of that. And So this was all from savings. It wasn't big money that time. And then, as I told you, some people starting with Shiv Nader were also funders, Arjun Malhotra, many of those people. But it was small funding. But the thing you have to remember is in education, it's a positive cash flow activity. See, you if, you if you have your kids in school, you have to pay the fee before. You can't say, I've studied for one year and I'll give the fee. So education is a positive. Money comes before the expenses are incurred. And so that has been a very important factor. Nowadays, people have to blow up you know, millions of dollars before the first piece of revenue comes. We neither had the luxury. Thank God we didn't have the luxury because the necessity, you know, gets you to think about ideas. So negotiating the terms of everything. And even when we started doing corporate business, telling companies to pay upfront for training was not easy. So it didn't need too much, but we did have to take loans. We did have to, and the early banks, Indian Overseas Bank was one of the early banks. The, the, their executive director had visited when we launched NIT, it was in Computer Society of India in Madras, Mr. Sony. He came and he, at that time, we had launched NIT as, as an idea whose time has come. That was our presentation. Okay. So he met us at the end of it. He said, I'm an executive director. We're looking at new things and you people are doing something interesting. So then with some assistance of people who were in the finance function, we went and met him. So they, stick the, they stuck their neck out. They, they said, this is a project that needs to be supported. Small amounts of money and in, in, in few lakhs, it wasn't in few crores. And then somewhat later with ICICI, when Mr. Kamath, well, it was one of the first loans he was involved with. And, 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 and that relationship holds to this day. I mean, we'll talk about that even when we did the joint venture with ICICI Bank to do the financial training in 2006, 25 years later. So tell me about the products you launched and what kind of pricing you had, how you were selling it, what kind of response you got in terms of how much revenue you were able to make and all. So when we launched the first programs in Bombay, Nariman Point, in early 82, we launched two courses. Okay, And one was on the basic language. It was called entry-level basic. Okay, And we called that a short-term course because that was, I think, four weeks long. Okay, And they were aimed largely at students. So we had to keep our 
time windows. It was two hours a day slot and we had slots throughout the course of the day. We didn't know which one would be popular, but we knew that post-college, post-classes and before classes will be popular. That was a four-week course and then we had a long-term course as we called it, which was 12 weeks at that time. Okay, So long-term for us. And there we were teaching people COBOL language. So the, the need was for computer programming languages. That was the need. But in building up the the idea of these products, we were quite clear that not just programming, it has to be the foundations of data, foundations of the programming logic. And as I mentioned, we started using videotaped instruction material from, from the US. There were basically two companies who competed intensely at that time. And one of them was called Advanced Systems Incorporated, ASI. They had outstanding content on video. And so we we looked at, they had a huge library of videos and they used to actually rent it to companies in the US. So we made an arrangement with them. Uh, interestingly, the arrangement happened because in when I was in HCL looking to solve this problem, I had looked at this material because in the same area where the HCL office was in Eru Place, there was a little, a one-man shop set up by, one-man company set up by the ex-EDP manager, now it's called CIOs of ICICI, Mr. Uttam Singh. And after retirement, he, had, he was very interested. He was an avid reader. He had got an agency for a few things, and one of which was these videotapes. But he didn't know how to go about. So I had seen this when I was trying to look at how to deal with the problem. So the, we started this company with an acquisition. We bought his little company. Yeah. And the little company basically meant some distribution rights. But more than that, he had stocked some of these programs. So... Then studying this video instruction, which I had started doing early 81 and 80 actually, out of curiosity, became clear that there was a huge repertoire of stuff. So putting together a series of modules to construct that four-week program and then a 12-week program. And we also realized quite early on that the accent would be a problem for our students. So we realized that it's not going to be enough to put a video in. And so we learned quite this even before when we were testing. We did some testing. We learned that people have many questions. And so we said, okay, and some pertain to, okay, I didn't understand that, or what did he say, something, something like that as well. So we decided that we would build con build material to support. So we had to make, we had to build, we built very good manuals. We called them student guides. And then we would have a coordinator guide. We, By the way, we never used the word teacher or faculty in our history. We were not in the education or teaching business. We were in the learning business. There's a very, very important difference as we learned at that time and we've been trying to say that in the teaching business, you focus on the teacher. In the learning business, you focus on the learner and that were different things. So even the, the literature on the subject had started talking about learner-centered, you know, the, the science of the subject, the science of pedagogy. And so it was learner-centered, objective-driven learning, what now is called outcome-based. At the end of this module, you should be able to write 10 lines or something in one hour with so many defects, less than so many. So it was measurable outcomes, but it was learner-centered. So we had the video instruction, we had a coordinator, and we had a learner. So there was a coordinator guide book, there was a student guide book, and there was a video, but soon we discovered that video was not enough. And those days, the overhead projector had just arrived on the scene. Okay, looks archaic right now, but today, at that time, with those plastic foils. So we, our classroom had the video. It had an overhead projector in a screen. It had a whiteboard. It had students with their court learner guide, student guides as we call them. And we had a coordinator with a coordinator guide. And so, so we defined the pedagogy that you first have to see the video. Then you have some exercises in the student guide. Then the coordinator will pose some questions. Then you work as a team and then you go to the computer room. So for us, hands-on was key. This is what we started off with a four-week and 12-week course. Soon, people trickled in and we had a batch of students and we had restricted the batch to 24, never more than that. So that, I think, was commonsensical, that large class, class small class. But uh, how did you spread the word? How did those 24 students come in? No, we had put in an ad. We put in an ad. Okay. We put in an ad. Yeah, we put in an ad. And when we did the tests, we did a small ad. By the way, those were the days of full-page ads. We could afford even we could afford a full page ad. But of course, that was a big investment. And the and and we figured that, you know, students, our early, early thing was that, well, students who had, have done a degree and they're waiting for a job, which was true for even the IIT guys that time. So around a little before that was the situation. No, no campus placement, no early. Nowadays, people go six months early and so on. 
So the ad which we put, the message was quite a simple one. It said, if you have a college degree and no job, this ad can change your life. That's the ad. Okay. Now, two years later, we actually had to do a huge correction, but I'll come to that later. But this was the proposition. So I think just the sheer size of the ad, and we used very creative people to do our advertising. So people came. But I think what worked was that these, the, the whole setting of our place, the intense focus on learners, and I will talk about the people dimension of everything because we were the largest recruiters of MBAs in the early 80s. We just wanted the best talent. And so we had this bright young MBAs from the IMs and uh, focused on, on this whole due method of learning, which is exciting to everybody. And we built a very strong capability to, I don't want to say research, but to do development and testing and, and new ideas and new methods and for us, you know, understanding the process of learning was, was not technology, it was science. And so, so how to design instruction that works. So many things we learned. We'll see if they come up for discussion later. But So what happened is that the word started spreading. The ads were quite responsible for things. And quite quickly in Bombay, we figured that people did want to learn this subject. There was curiosity. But more than that, the learning method was so different from what they were used to. And they had very young people teaching them. And people very keen to help people learn, I would say. Very, very obsessed about seeing the outcomes. And so it started, I think it started picking up by word of mouth. There was no internet then. But all these, many of these were college-going students. Even though we said, if you have no job, they are college-going students. And then more, more came. And then we started seeing people coming from companies. So someone came and then their EDP manager came. He said, I have more people to train. So, so they also sent a few people. So I think the people saw the value of it quite quickly. They found the environment of other eagerly eager people trying to learn. The cohort there were young, you know, bright people. And we used to do an aptitude test from day one. We were quite rigorous. We'd spend a lot of time. Yeah. So we were looking for aptitude. We were not, we looked at how they have done in school. But our, our thing was because by then that I had learned in HCL also that an aptitude for programming has nothing to do with maths and physics and chemistry, first of all. And it took us a few years to prove to the world that you didn't have to be mathematics to be a brilliant programmer. But we proved it with, then with ample evidence. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl. It didn't matter what subject you had started if you had the aptitude. So we had invested a lot of time to figure out how to assess aptitude. We looked at all kinds of tests from all over the world to see how to judge aptitude. And then we also realized that those who were doing a short-term course, many of them said, now we want a long-term course, but not everybody said. So that shaped our thinking that we have to be careful not to, that there should be multiple exits. That shaped our product thinking over a period of time. When we had long-term program, we said, okay, sign up for a semester if you want. And then some people could, so then we had the whole highway model of enter anywhere exits at different points, multiple entry, multiple exits. So all these were based on the immediate customer feedback. When did corporate training get set up? In the 80s only? Yeah, it was all in the 80s. In fact, it was quite rapid. We were working 18 hours a day, so it was like three shifts. But each one doing three shifts. So it was exciting time. Like, like, give me a summary of what all you achieved in the 80s. Like, So we, a lot happened. So we started these three centers. Then we opened Calcutta. Then we opened Bangalore. Then we opened Pune. And quite, quite, quite early in the business, we realized that we were onto something very important because there was a demand for it. And of course, we realized we'll have to scale. So in addition to doing much more development of our own because the videotapes were helpful, but they had constraints. So by then we started building content. We realized it'll have to build a lot of content. And then we hired again a few PhDs from IIT, Delhi, my alma mater. We started interacting with thought leaders on the subject in the US and Europe. So the MIT, MIT had a Center for Information Systems Research and the Oxford University had Oxford Institute of Management. So these people were experimenting with what to do with information systems and information it wasn't as much technology. And we were immediately realizing that you know, the, the, among these segments that were opening up for us, we said you have a college degree and no job is where we started. And soon it became you know, people who were studying in college as well. And soon it became people who were working. And soon it became the chairman of companies who said, look, my company wants to do something. So we started looking at these as segments to deal with. And the, these segments opened up quite rapidly. I think within the first two years, we had done a program for the Indian oil chairman and his executive directors. And he just had come back from abroad. He said, everybody's using computers. We are using, you guys are doing something. Tell us. So we had an informal chat and became, and then we, we designed, much later we designed a program 
two day program for senior management but in 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 terms of evolution of segments to your question in two years later we came to a very important conclusion we said a college guy who has no job is he the smartest guy shouldn't we be looking for smart people in college we go upstream and one of the very bright youngsters youngsters who joined us from i am calcutta he worked used to work with me as product manager we say and he he was very instrumental in getting us to rethink that let's not look at the college kid who doesn't have a job let's look for the smart college kid who's still in college and has enough time and has the intellect to absorb some more and is curious so we started at that time what we called the dual qualification scheme that while you are in college you do our programs now that was a game changer because suddenly we had to then start going into colleges so there the ad wouldn't work college kid don't read newspapers even then then we started going into the colleges and doing many different kinds of events so we would for example we would just say okay we're going to give a, a talk and we'll give a quiz and whoever tops gets a free course now kids love to compete i mean that we've known as children so they would all come and compete for the who's first who's second who's third and most of them came to do the course but some were doing it for the heck of it so within colleges also this whole thing of computers was getting hot because colleges didn't have computers and they were beginning to see that computers are coming and is being talked off and so this attachment to institutions of higher learning which then became even institute decade later with schools as well but that became a very important change for us that was one second is the interest started coming from smaller towns and then we realized that we either have to now and this is all in the 80s i'm talking about the 80s so first thing was quick response to newer segments recognition of the different segments preparation of products for these which are very distinct and uh, then the fact that computer time was a real problem so we realized we had to maximize that and then this whole need emerging from l- many locations even young some people coming and saying we want to why didn't to start an it here and so on so this last point was very important for us because we were very clear that in the service industry between the customer and the key decision maker between the customer and the key decision maker you can't have too much of a gap for example if you your favorite restaurant if you go to the owner comes and checks up how stuff going because he can take the decision which make a difference in services so so habib the the hair cutter when people say mai habib se baal katane you nobody else then he even when he built his franchises the problem was he couldn't be in so many places so we realized that we if we started building layers of management management between us and the guy who runs the center we lose it all so we said how do we retain the entrepreneurship at the point of contact and that is how the idea of creating business partners was we never used the word franchisee because that's in literature as an adversarial adversarial relationships so, you know we the whole idea of partnership i was telling you earlier as well was very important so we said we want business partners who will do this like we are doing it in the big cities so if vijay was based in bombay and i was in delhi and rajendran was in and then these young bright young mbas were in different places we said that there's a limit to how many center we will be able to run without having an entrepreneurship element so we started <clears throat> this idea of setting up centers in partnership with like minded people and this is also the time when we were realizing that we had to rewrite a lot of the content we can't depend on because india was interesting at that time our our, our new computer companies were working with microprocessors at the same time as bill gates was not the mainframe companies right so india was quite ahead at that time so we said that if we have to set up centers then we want first of all we want to maintain the standard so we we knew that you know nit should stand for something and be consistent wherever you do it that was very important very clear very clear to us and second is that we need someone who we can trust at that place and someone who will deliver to the quality so we when the even within our own expansion we realized that processes had to be good it's not a machine we are in the services business you not you can get a good machine put good raw material the same stuff comes out but in services you know it's very different so we said now okay what kind of people do we need and how do we make sure they will do the right thing so we had got on the iso process even before we thought of this international standards but the process documenting your process to the last level of detail and training people and measuring and all of that so the processes were falling into place and as engineers we had you know we were accustomed to that control engineering so then we said fine so we can put processes together but we we said fine we'll also design the layout of the place any center should have the same look and feel and so the color schemes and the kind of furniture and the kind of equipment so we said the bill of materials is very clear the drawing layouts are clear 
but of course it will be different places so the, each one each office that we went to we found different office but we had the same architect helping us to figure out and same central team looking at that and then came the question of what kind of people should we find and we made again a very important decision we said all the big cities have youngsters coming from small towns looking for jobs and so the guy belongs to merit he's got a family bungalow he's got everything and here he comes and lives on it on a shim paying guest or barsati in delhi as we call it so we said these guys are bright they've gone through education they come to big companies which are in big places so among them and so they they know systems they know processes they they know standard they have you know they're not you know, shooting from the hip and we said among them we have to find people who want to try something of their own and that thinking was very useful we picked nine people in the first year 86 87 and hand picked and did extensive work in those cities to make sure that they have to take ownership for that city ownership to get the right students and their responsibility to to run the program by that time we were doing a six month program as well so the products were coming out and responding to needs and we were trying to structure them into okay this is now a three month program and then we had another three month model became a six month program and as we came to the end of the year we had got you know a one year program so we had also had to start thinking about how to structure these products to make them meaningful and so when we got the first set of business partners we also quite quickly realized a couple of things which came in very handy we said now how do we make sure this guy doesn't compromise on quality so it struck us that if these guys are bright people who worked in big cities and co- can go back to their home their parents would be happy they'll be happier but they won't get that job but maybe they have an itch to do something of their own but they don't have the the risk taking capacity to do it on their own so this we started thinking is an ideal person for us but then we also found an interesting thing we said because there's a huge demand at that time when we went to a city and then 100 people would apply or not 100 but i said 20 or 30 then we would do get them to do a study we give them a little format to study is there a demand so we trained 15 people or 20 people in the city then we narrowed down to five or six then we gave them a you know it was called a business information brochure one and which was just okay how many schools how many college how many people blah 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 and then we looked at those people heard them out and then took three or four or five who said look promising now let's look at the family background look at their ability to invest because they'll have to now invest so your question about investment we were looking for people in our in our mold and therefore they should have the ability to invest in, in their center and then we said that give them the business information brochure number 2 bip 2 which was very big so detailed it gave them a lot of the stuff of what we were doing so in fact we were giving a lot of our know how away but we said we didn't think of it then and then we had to choose one out of the two or three finalists and and i can recall that for the many years it used to be a real problem for us because there were two or three very good choices they were so emotionally involved by then and we said we can only give it to one and but that time then we said okay one criterion which is important is that look for a person from a family which has a reputation in their small town because that's our best check for quality the father will not let the son cut corners ki mere izzat ka sawal hai this was very important for us and it's not a surprise that many of them got then recognized in their cities and states as people who contributed to digital literacy to job creation and all of them i can say the early phase at least the first 5 6 years of partnership went on to do exceedingly well in life children studied whatever they want went abroad do whatever and in fact that posed for us a problem much later of succession of these partners and i'll come to that later some way for the plus some way is the minus but so this this partnership for us was key i was making that point and we had realized that in fact when we started and i we had to make this student guide and coordinator guide we needed to get them printed and so in our team the third person rajendran and then there was a fourth person who joined us later a couple of years later so rajendran is the is the perfectionist of the lot so his his task was to make sure that this stuff is to the last level of detail and so making the booklet making the folder you know making sure it's zero defect and perfect in fact even now i met i met somebody recently who says i still have the folder i started with that in 86 or 87 i still have it it sits in my desk so anyway so we had to then find a printer so we went to the big printers in delhi and they were not too excited about this bunch of guys coming they wanted to print the bible they wanted to print big things you know, 10000 copies they would have some minimum order quantity yeah we found someone behind south extension maybe a 10 by 15 shop of three brothers who were starting a printing business who now are by the way north india's biggest printers they remained with us when we went to iso raju told them you be iso otherwise you won't work with you 
So we force them to keep moving up. And I think they followed processes, they followed the sensitivity to quality. And so if, when I'm talking of pr partnerships, every one of our vendors, we I never differentiated between the respect you pay to a customer and the respect to pay to a vendor, which is, I think, a very common weakness. The customer, please come in, it's a supplier, just sit outside. That to me was was not human humane thing to do. I think in 84 or 85, we were the biggest recruiters of MBAs from IM Calcutta. We 19 people majored in systems that year. And Professor Ramoya used to be the director then. We hired 18 of them. I am Calcutta system. That's because we, by then we had got into working for large companies and they said, now come and help. So these large companies, public sector in the beginning and then many others, uh, they, they said, you've taught us for two days. Now help us plan out. So we got into consulting practice. And the fourth person in our team, Arvind Thakur, was IIT Kharagpur, 75. He joined us in our in our third, second or third year. But I call him a founder. He's in that sense. By the way, another, another first in our industry. The same set of people who started are still intact. Can't find another company with that. And I get to the same issue of relationships and, and partnerships. So Arvind was the only one among four of us who had written a line of program. Because he, after his doing his studies, he went to industrial engineering in Niti and then joined BHEL. He was a programmer in BHEL. Then after that, soon after that, he joined us. So he, in fact, eventually became the CEO of a software business. He set up the software business. But he was working with the CEOs and they would say, why don't you help us do an information system plan? And so the, the guy who had sent one young employee to go and do a course at the NIT center and saw this guy doing stuff, he said, some more have to come. And then he told his boss that, look, let's. And then the boss, some of the guys at the top said, okay. People, at that time, the CEOs of companies are going and working with their partners in the US and Europe and saying, bloody hell, they are far ahead. We have to do something on computers. So that demand was a latent demand. And that time, we used to go around to the big cities and do what we called as an equivalent of fireside chat. Call in 10 or 15 CEOs and have an evening chat with coffee to late afternoon or drinks in the evening. And we, we had a brief session called Top management imperatives for computerization. Based on all the studies done all over the world of how management has to get involved or doesn't get involved. So we'd give them an evening one hour session. And many of them would say, look, I think I need it for my whole team. And then we designed that as a two-day program, morning till evening. And I would say that, you know, even the CEOs of the largest companies at that time sat in. And they were accustomed to coming for an hour and starting the seminar and going away. And many stories, we don't have time, but. Dr. Irani was head of Tata Steel and his head of HR told him that, look, we have to do this program. Many, many companies are doing it. You get your board. We're going for mass scale computerization. So they said, well, he'll sit for an hour. He won't sit more. But he sat through both days and first day night. He said, please come and chat with me and some people. I think what you guys are making, saying is making sense because we have to do mass scale computerization. We have the labor issues. We have So there were surfacing issues. I would say we were responding. So we said, fine, this two-day we will do. And then many of them said, fine, it's very easy for you to come and tell us, teach us. Now, why don't you help hand hold us? And Arvind Thakur then took the responsibility to build a methodology for consulting, which is where we studied information systems, planning as it was being taught in the best institutions in the world. And we would invite people to do lecture circuits and learn from them. And so we built a methodology called critical information system planning, which would help companies and boards put a three to five year IS plan with budgets, target, structure, there has to be a CIO, there has to be a department. So this was all happening in the 80s, second half of the 80s. So we started with consulting before we did software development. And so now, at this time, it was still integrated. There were people who were doing the instruction. They were coordinator of the learning process. They were also consulting. And these are a lot of these very bright young people coming out of IMs with their textbooks of what, what's the latest literature and then sitting with the chairman of Indian Oil and reading the book on the sign that says, you know, it was taking knowledge to practice. And I have to say, our customers were really, really supportive and fond of us, if you can say. We told them, look, this is new. And they said, right, we know it's new, but we trust you guys. And I think that has stayed with us through. I mean, last year, for example, last two years, in our international business where we deal with Fortune 100 companies, we had 100% customer retention. All of our, you know, the... the the Unilevers and the Rolls Royces, all of them knew with us. So I guess it comes back to the question of the people equation and the trust and, and partnership. You said that uh, video, you wanted to replace uh, the video instruction format. What did you replace it with? So in 84, along with IIT Delhi, which is my alma mater, and with the panel which had the who's who of computer science in those days, Dr. Sisha Giri being one of the early youngsters at that time, but elders also, people who had been head of DRDO. 
we held a conference called Computers in Education and Training. So 83, Comet 83. We, we did that in IIT. And we were pushing for the use of computers in learning at that time. And the very first conference of that anywhere happened in 84 in the US, which I attended, attended all of them, presented papers. So we had these very, very bright people, as I told you, that many of them were IIT, IM types, in large measure, pushing the foundation, the knowledge. We had a brilliant guy, two brilliant people who came from IIT Delhi, PhDs. Dr. Sugata Mitra, who got a TED Prize recently, who also did the hole in the wall experiment in 1999 to show that what if you have no teachers? That that research we didn't call hole in the wall because outside a software facility was a slum. And he pretty much made a hole, stuck a computer with very good touch sensitive screen and mapped it in the lab to see if you have uninitiated kids who are not even going to school, how do they learn? The theory is that we build on what we learn before, but if you have groups of activism is the knowledge, is the term that you construct. But collaborative constructivism is what we coined by saying that if you give a bunch of kids, uninitiated kids, a device which has a touch sensitive screen and is connected to content like the internet, then they will find a way to learn. They will co teach. So that was the hole in the wall experiment, which then became very globally very important. And right now we have a foundation, NIT foundation, that already runs a thousand of these kiosks in the rural parts of India as CSR activity. Because there the question we were asking is, earlier we said, okay, we found in the 80s, we found a way to find teachers and coordinators of the learning process. Then when the scaling started to happen in the end 80s, 90s, when the finally went... How many uh, centers did you have in 90s? Like by the time you... 40 countries, 2000. No, by the end of the 90s, 40 countries, 2000 learning centers, which then shrank in the next decade because of colleges teaching it, schools teaching it, and people didn't have to spend years learning a programming language. All things happened. But in the scaling up, we were posing newer questions. So our, the R&D center, which we had, I had joined the board of IIT around that time, my alma mater. So we were trying to get the industry academia linkage thing happen. So I really nudged our board at IIT Delhi to get some startups in the campus. So we built a new building called Synergy. That's the name I gave it. And we said a couple of floors have to be startups. So we took a floor to set up the NIT R&D Center. We moved it from Nehru Place. And later on, by the way, when the university was formed, that was a gift from NIT Limited to the university. The whole research team went to that not-for-profit. So Dr. Mitra and co were always pushing the limit on. So by then we were saying, okay, we are now finding a way to get coordinators to the learning process. But what? What if you don't even have a teacher? So the digital divide question was posed to us actually a little later, late 90s, which then got us to create a line of business which was working with in a, in a public-private partnership, one of the first and very successful ones with state governments. We would do a build-operate transfer project for schools. And, and we started the project in 1999, did it for 10 years, where at peak we were in 26,000 government schools in most states in the country. And we would sign a contract to run and we would say, oh, in your government village school, give us a room. We will put the phone line. We put, you know, hundreds or thousands of phone lines in places which didn't have phones. We got a generator because some places were very hot. We had to have an air conditioner. We did the civil work of the room. The doors and windows were broken. We got the furniture. We put an instruct coordinator. We gave them course materials. We built course materials in multiple languages. And that was actually a digital divide thing. 11 million people, children were trained in, in that decade as a public-private partnership thing. So we said, okay, now this we are doing, but simultaneously, what about children who are outside school? And that led to the hole in the wall research, which basically said that if you give connected devices, along with some structure and content and with easy to use screens, and let a young group of children self-organize. So Sugata was proving that if people didn't have to come to the NIT classroom. He was telling us, you guys will be out of business. <laughs> because, and we said, keep pushing. We have to obsolete ourselves. So the so the, there was a continuous improvement. So for example, in the in 1990, I remember the biggest challenge used to be computer time. So we introduced something called unlimited computer time. So in New Delhi in Connaught Place, we had rented a huge place which had about 150 computers. We called it computer drome, like a cyclodrome. And there were and we did that in in Chennai, we did it in Bangalore, in Calcutta. We couldn't do it in Bombay because you can't get that space. We did something else in Bombay. So the computer drome was a place where every student was entitled to unlimited time. So from your learning centers all over Delhi, you took time. But when you wanted another 10 hours and you want to work in the night, 24 by 7, this is working. So we broke this myth of limited computer time. And in Bombay, we had to do something else. So we did something called carry PC. There was some person who was trying to make a portable little computer, low cost, 
And so in Bombay, we announced that, that if you join this course, you carry a PC home. And we, we encountered a credibility problem. People said, come on here. People don't have computers. You're giving me. So it was, it took time to convince people. You see, they said, you mean I can take it home? I said, yeah, take it home. Because you want unlimited computer time. So it ran for a few years. So I think all these, as you can see, are responses to problems. And But listening very actively. And, and I think when people say you have vision, I think you don't need a vision. Well, you need a vision. Vision the madness, basically. But you need to be very aware of the problems on the ground. So our business partners were entrepreneurs. When did you go international? This was in 90s? Like... So 1991, when we were 10 years old, precisely, and a year before we listed, we had work coming to us in India from US on computer-based training, on the use of computers and learning. So there's an entity in the US which had figured out this small outfit which was using, now it's using the laser disc as well. It's using, it's on the cutting edge of using new technology, computer-based training and then beyond. And the laser disc, random access disc came into picture. We've tested all of them. We built, we built many software technologies at platforms and so on, what people are now talking about all the time. So learning management systems and so on were built early on. So, so we had a customer and that customer was IBM. So they said, we want to do CBT, but you have to come and do it here. So we went to Atlanta for that reason, because that center for education, customer education was in Atlanta. That's why we set up the office in Atlanta. And that still is our U.S. headquarters. Now, of course, Atlanta is seen as a good place to go to. But at that time, it was a nice, cool place. So IBM became the first customer to build computer-based training, because IBM was, for quite a while, the biggest trainer in the world. They were training the whole world. So they had zillions of courses, all taught in the classroom. And they wanted to then convert them to CBT. That was one of our big contracts. So it was outsourcing of a very interesting type that we would have our people sit in the five-day classroom, video shoot it, make a lot of notes, ship that stuff back to our instructional software entity who would then convert into computer-based training and send it back. It started like that, but then the software business actually came out of, for us, Singapore office. We set up an office. And the interesting thing was the consulting work we had done in the 80s was extremely useful in the Far East, which had open economies. You know, people were importing all the computers they wanted to buy, but they didn't have, they didn't know what to do with them. India had been starved of computers in the 80s. But we had done this, all this information system planning because our customers wanted to. We found great use of that in Indonesia at that time. It was a big market for us in Malaysia, Singapore. Singapore, in fact, in the prime minister's office, we had done projects at that time in the early 90s, which are cutting edge. So there we were actually doing information system planning and information system management, drawing up IT plan, not body shopping. We never went into the process of body shopping because, well, it just happened. That we had these bright young MBAs who had chosen to stay in India and so had we. we four of us were IIT grads who preferred never to go abroad. And so these youngsters were here. So the Singapore operation opened our eyes to the need to help companies put their solutions together because the US and Europe had IS experience. Malaysia had equipment which landed up with little experience. India had no equipment, but we had to grow from ground up. So when we went to the U.S., we were doing instruction, instructional software, educational software, before we started doing other things. In Singapore, we were putting together solutions. In fact, in Bank Bali, which is one of the biggest banks, the whole network was set up by us. So we gathered a lot of experience of putting solutions together, and then we took that to the U.S. and Europe, and that built our software business. So the software business, which was a consulting practice in the 80s, 90s onward was a boom time. But we, unlike big software companies, were doing Y2K and large mainframe software, we were at the cutting edge. We couldn't be teaching old stuff. We were teaching new stuff. So all our projects were on newer technologies, on relational databases, on Unix operating system. So I remember that one of the first projects we did was for Sun Microsystems, which was the worldwide sales incentive system to be run on distributed networks. And we did that project for them, which Sun Microsystems, Scott McNeely was personally supervising to see how does this, how do we do a distributed system? So we're doing interesting projects and that created the software business, which grew. Tell me about the IPO. You know, you were a fairly young company when you did IPO. What what kind of revenue were you doing when you did IPO? 92, I'll have to get the figure, but maybe about 20 or 30 or 40 crores, something like that, sub 100 crores. And we, I think, raised 18 crores, that much I remember. 10 rupees share at, with a 40 rupee premium. It was oversubscribed. It went very well. And so 18 crores is what we raised. And many companies have, I've seen raise money when the markets are right. Somehow we felt that that was not the right thing to do. We felt you raise the money when you need it. Now I have to think twice about it because there are times when you can get money easily and times when you can't, but you should have a plan for it. So 
we used that money at that time to set up our, as we call them, the software factories. Okay. We pushed the idea of offshoring because we did. We were not into business, into body shopping, which was a big thing in the 80s and 90s also. So because we were India-centered, India-based software facilities were here. So I think as a percentage of our offshore body shopping was minuscule because that was not the model we were built on. Good, bad is not an important issue. And we were working on new technologies because we had the education business, which was predicated on knowing the future. People want to learn new things, which is still valid. We, we, our courses do come up pretty much ahead of anybody else on any topic. So that time, the idea was then to set up a software centers. And we also figured that even in the metros, we had to set up more centers. We set up what we called as automated learning centers, which is where working professionals could come. And we had most advanced technology, the laser disk technology, all, all content, everything. And we've done many, many things with technology and learned that we were always ahead of time and learned that technology alone never does a solution, which is what people are discovering now after this COVID time. We, you know, I should send you an article I wrote quite early on when COVID started, when people were going bonkers about online learning. And so I had written an article, I'll send it to you. It was called, I think, Online Learning, Bored Students, Exhausted Teachers. Okay. And people kind of laughed it off, but over a period of time, I think very obvious because we had been at it from 81 you have to remember and yet we were doing the mistake of we in 1996 we had announced the first virtual university called net varsity but it didn't do well because net was too slow so while we offered it to students it was way ahead of its time yeah yeah so 2013 we launched what we called as a cloud campus so this curiosity we just keep testing the ground got us to test very many things before time and Therefore, some didn't fly. Many didn't fly. NIT.TV, we were giving free instruction long time back and we found that no one wants it if you give it free. So we also bought a company whose, uh, we still have the URL which we will use called training.com. We own that URL because I think we knew early on that, you know, and now we know that the native, digital natives will learn a little more, but even they, only 5%, thumb rule, and this I now look back and say only 5% of all learners are motivated enough that they will sit under the lamp with the book and learn. All the remaining ones need a teacher and a test and a beating and a mother and a stick and a, you know, we need a huge support system. We need a huge support system. And India is, is, is even more over caring. The mother will give a milk, glass of milk, you have a karo, the father will come and see no comics going on. So we have a very intrusive structure to assist a learner to learn. So when you remove that, you don't learn. And yet I know that the cohort, in any cohort, the 5% of the brightest who need not be the highest mark scorers are self-learners. They always were, they even today are. But then for the rest of rest of us, we need a blended model. And so so these these tests which we were doing, pushing ourselves ahead of time and continue to do to this date is helpful because it, it set, helps us set the right boundaries. So the IPO was essentially to set up the software consulting and rather expand it, so like the consulting. So... Yeah, software factories. No, no, by then, then consulting had become a small part of the big thing. What is the difference between the consulting business and software factories? Like software factories where you're actually writing code for clients. You're writing code, you're testing th- stuff, you're populating databases. So it has a reasonable amount of process-sizable work. Consulting is you're asking new questions. So, of course, all, all practices have to be led by consulting-led. So, as I said, when we were listening to our customers, we were doing consulting without calling it that bright, curious people talking to customers and trying to see what does he want to do next. And that has pushed us to keep ahead of time all the time because we continue to have bright people. So we, so on the people side, I'll, I'll just talk of the first two decades then we go. The 80s, as I said, we were populating our organization with really brilliant young people. 90s, when we had started the GNIT program, which was the product, if ever there was a product on earth, everybody wanted to do GNIT. Right? That was a flagship three years you do with college. Well, it was, yeah. So it was like this. So I told you, we said college degree and no job was two years. Then we said dual qualification. You're bright enough in college. And we said, if you have three years to do college and you do six months or one year concurrently, then when you go for a job interview, you're better equipped. Okay. Then when we did the GNIT, that was actually, we, we had the good fortune that two very bright people, post-retirement, 
one was professor mitra who retired as director of bits pilani and the second was professor jimmy isaac jr isaac yit bombay who had set up the computer center there one of india's bright computer scientists they retired and they said we want to spend some time with you at 10 years we had from 90 till 2000 1 2 3 we had these two people guiding us one on information science and what it means and the other on, on education administration and i haven't seen a smarter education administration person i can say worldwide than cr mitra or bits pilani shaped our thinking so he is actually he visited us to say that he had seen what we were doing and he had some thoughts of what we should do so we he helped us conceptualize the journey for the next 10 years and so the gnit was born out of that work which he and the team did which basically meant that a college going student has at least 3 years in ba bsc and so on later on 4 years in engineering during that time we should give them enough computer input concurrent to their studies and the moment they finish their 3 years we should put them in a company for internship for one year we will have to arrange that so the task of signing up hundreds and then later thousands of companies to be partners for that and we pretty much bullied them into saying you have to give them this much salary internship and that was fixed as the amount full fee the student has paid us so at the end of 4 years a student has done his 3 years in college got a degree done one year with us as in internship but four semesters and then we gave it a title we couldn't give a degree as a for profit so it was it stood for graduate of nit but we couldn't say call it that we called gnit and so that person didn't have to go for a job because those companies where it did internship you know, nine times out of 10 they hired them so our, our desire to fulfill the basic obligation for a learner that they come and get a job and now of course it is to to get an upgrade or to get the next job so that the at the outcome of our activity consistently has said even the university university which is a young university 13 years only every year every student before convocation has a job including the couple of years so because that's the, that's the commitment that's the commitment so by the end of 90 end of 90s you said you had 2000 centers 40 countries what percentage of your revenue was training what percentage was from software because you also had the software factories running and like did you do acquisitions during the 90s also or did it start in the 2000s you know we started from the 90s i would say and i did say we started with an acquisition little one yes 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 true but we did in the 90s so the us office which we set up i said i told you we sent two bright guys one was an 82 batch mba from i am the the first batch that we should catch and the other one was an 84 batch from 84 85 batch from i am calcutta so the first one went to the us to set up the us office the second one went to singapore to set up far east office and the us we started doing projects in newer technologies and came across some very interesting small companies which were doing creative work and so in the i think it was perhaps in the 90s itself that we started second half we started saying okay how do we learn about that what these guys are doing so we started a process of taking a small equity in some of these companies because some of these people were doing work which was interesting to corporate customers so we saw it also as an as a way to tag along with them or take them along to solve a problem so so edge investing we called it at the edge invest at the edge and give us a sharp edge so we did some of those investments and we then also started looking at toward the end of the decade in fact early part of the decade we we saw that so for example post dot com which is the same situation as today or was like 2008 as well we saw some very very good assets were getting into difficulty and the the very good some of the very good acquisitions we did were in, in that period some very good acquisitions tell me about some of them let, let me talk about a very interesting one we did in 2003 which was not the biggest but it was a very interesting one so this is a company called cognitive arts now cognitive yeah. arts was set up by a guy called professor roger shank who was at yale and they were he had done his, his work is very interesting his work just to take 15 seconds was premised on an insight that learning takes place when there's a failed expectation you can relate with that okay you you take a road every year you turn right every year and one day there's a repair work going on now you learn that you can't go this way there was an expectation to go this way so i'm oversimplifying but everything is like that you do things in a certain way something goes wrong why we say mistakes are an opportunity and so on so when there's a failed expectation that is one so he said okay we have to now design instruction where you get people to fail okay but then they he went a step ahead to say okay now people are making mistakes all the time the purpose of learning is to go to zero mistakes so the management aspect of his work was that you go study mistakes in large organizations in repetitive jobs 
and put a cost to each mistake and see how many million they make in a year and then list them down in descending order of where's the money getting lost and attack that problem so this they had got as a know how when they came into northwestern university and set up university got them to set up the institute for learning sciences and roger shank and his team were working on that and then this boom was happening in the 90s so they got some investment they created a company called cognitive arts so cognitive arts was doing work for the biggest okay on this what was called the critical mistakes analysis methodology so imagine the number of cashiers in a walmart for example okay zillions of them okay all of them make mistakes or the guys who think stock things in shelves so repetitive jobs of a large scale finding the mistakes then simulating those mistakes in instruction and getting people to draw lessons so cognitive arts started becoming a great success and then they got some investors then dot com happened then people started cutting their budgets and then this company came up for acquisition so we bought it and the designs many of the early original phd's team came along with them with the with the team and that's our design studio which is based even now in chicago instructional design part of the team is there part of course a big team in india as well very big team in india in india we probably have one of the biggest content facilities under one roof anywhere in the world so but that's the design when you talk of consulting the pedagogical design and so that was a very interesting company because then we started using that across the system and led us to build on to build a proposition which we call as managed training services so we cannot manage the training service in a company because you're coming with a business logic so if you go to a ceo of any large company and say how much does your company spend on training you wouldn't know if you ask him what do you get out of it he says that well i'm not sure so what the software business was doing for software outsourcing we said we should do it for learning so the learning process outsourcing was the idea and then we said why don't we go to them and say look you can't even measure what you're spending and you don't even know what you're getting and we've been working on outcomes for forever and ever and we are curious people will figure out what the problem is so now we have multi multi million dollar contracts in that corporate part of the business for the fortune 100 and jump to 2022 acquisitions we've done a very interesting acquisition called st charles consulting so arthur anderson when it had to break up if you remember into when when all the problems happened 2008 i don't know when yeah all of the, all of that so that time they like many other companies they had this central training facility in a place called st charles and which was doing all their internal training so when all that break up happened the person who was running it bought over that activity and they've been running that as a very very top end strategic training thing with a large network of on small network of full time employees a large network of trainers we have bought that now okay so so they would train on soft skills and no no it's also on strategy but they have a methodology they have they and they have a good understanding on how the fortune 100 companies think about building capability and building talent so so i'm just saying that jumping to the next stage but coming to the that's the last the last acquisition did we did for st charles but so cognitive art became very important for for getting a good idea of the science and the management of delivering learning to corporates and built a line of business for us which we call managed training services which has made us one of the top 3 players in pure play training in the world now but the the bigger one we did was a company called element k which was in rochester and i'm just trying to see that was in 2006 cognitive arts of 2003 now this was a big company they had they were actually 80 million dollars revenue so huge for that, for us at that time and what was your revenue at that time when you were acquiring them i think by then we were doing with them we were doing 160 million so it was half our size it was very big together we became 250 million at that time so so this was uh, this was a very big thing for us and uh, interestingly we exited this many years later to another company at a very good profit because it gave us a huge library of content and a huge access into the market then we built we moved the content development to india and then another company which is very big in digital content who was a customer of us for training they bought that entity because we we didn't want to do packaged content development we wanted to customize more and more so that was a very big one and then 2000 so there are many many acquisitions 2016 we did a very interesting one in india a very bright young team in bangalore called Sir perceptron they were doing a pedagogy for teaching advanced technical skills to people very rapidly and so that that was we call it stack root full stack learning so stack root today is delivers the best impact on learning for complex skills to bright young people 
this whole methodology. And that, that's what we're using now for Indian, large Indian customers. We'll take it to the US as well. So that's another thing which is collaborative constructivism different. Bright young people broken into group given problems with mentors, very little classroom. They just, they're making. It's a maker model. Then recently we bought, two years ago, we bought a company called Regatta, which is an acquihire, a small team in the US which is working in ARBR. Then we bought a company called Eagle, which is US again, 2018. They were very focused on doing some kind of training for the pharmaceutical industry. So they do rollouts. You know, when they have a new method or a new regulation or something, they have to roll it out across the organization. So they had very strong capability of rollout in a regulated sector. We saw that as a core, core kind of capability. So that got us also very quick entry into the pharma sector in the managed training services business. So then in 2008, we had bought in India a small company called Evolve. They were teaching English language in India. Then actually last four years, I talked about 2020, we did Ricata. 2021, we did a very interesting company in India, which was a good size company. And we bought them for about 80 crores called RPS. So they are working in a very focused manner on the, the, you know, what are called the GCCs, the Global Competency Centers. Large international companies who have their development centers in India, right? Think all the large companies have huge development centers in India, in Bangalore, in Hyderabad, you know. And so RPS has been focused on doing their internal training. So that was a segment we were not doing, not doing too much. We were doing for the big IT companies of India, we were doing global companies, but this whole GCC community they have very good capability in that. But the range of products we have, the extent of science we have, technology we have. So coming together of this is 2020, 2021. And 2022, we did another Indian, small Indian company, which they have very good immersive content. Their methodologies do good immersive content. And so we, we've we done a small investment. It's not a full acquisition. So you can see that we are very careful about and, and and I think very nuanced about what we want for what. And then I told you about St. Charles, which is a full full acquisition. So the acquisition entries and exits have happened over a period of time to fit into the strategy of what we're trying to work on. Tell me something. Why did you change your strategy to focus more on B2B? From So in 2000, you had, I think you told me about 2000 centers across 40 countries. So then, you know, why the pivot to focus more on B2B from here? And in 2000, trading was contributing to how much of revenue? Like, was it more than 50% between software factories, consulting and trading? By then, they were probably coming to equal levels. Learning was probably a little more, but both good size, both good size, equal profitability. So we did not pivot to B2B, first of all. So the consumer part of the learning business, which is where individuals had to pay for themselves, is a developing country model. In the US, the company would pay for their employees, number one. Number two, building a brand in a developed country is a damn sight expensive process. So when we went to an Indonesia or an Af one of the African countries or Middle Eastern countries, it was much easier to take our brand, to take our business model of franchise or business partners we did try, to be fair, we did try in the US in, in, to do that and discovered that it was the marketing costs were just prohibitive and we wanted to remain within the reach of people and their personal budgets. On the other hand, we didn't pivot to B2B. What I have to say is that when we started the India business, it was a consumer activity and gradually we got pulled into working for companies. And so therefore, that became a business where we were then reaching out to companies and doing training programs for them. Okay. When we went global, when we went to the US, we were doing first for IBM. And then we actually, at peak, within about a decade, we were working for 39 out of 50 computer companies doing content for them in the US. Okay, And then soon, many of those companies said, you're doing IT content. Can you do other content, but on the computer? So, so earlier, it was IT as content and IT as form, both the form and content. Then it became IT as form, but non-IT as content. That happened in the 90s as well. And then when the cognitive arts and all happened, then we realized we had a methodology, we had a set of customers, we had very good references. So the US-Europe business, watching, working with Fortune 100, was growing very well. Our few experiments, we even tried actually in Hong Kong, we tried to do a center. That was the second center. The first one we did in Nepal when we went outside in 1995. Nepal ran like India. It was a grand success. Hong Kong, we discovered the cost of marketing was too high. We had to remodel. So we discovered that the B2C, B2B, whatever you want to call it, that getting to consumers is a very expensive proposition in markets where the costs of marketing are huge. And also where com companies pay for that. 
there's an entitlement mentality so so today we don't use that word in india because in india we work for if you do work for a bank so we have trained thousands of people for icici access bank that's a combined thing there we make a proposition to the marketplace so we will say okay icici is going to hire so many people if you're interested you have to do this course because if you find you suitable for the course you'll get an appointment later so now is it b2b b2c those are artificial constraints so it's all what the real need is so therefore this though both have been growing and we are just responding to market needs as they come rather than decide see today you want to have a market entry we over specify to get a little narrow place and keep spending money to crack it within quotes in our case we think that an evolutionary model but we were fortunate as i said to start early there's always a beginner's advantage but even today we have started and then rolled down many businesses exited we exited software which is a highly profitable business because our main thrust was always education but it was a very profitable business and till a certain point they were reinforcing each other consulting was about you know the marriage of both we saw ourselves in the knowledge business always and so we merged the companies in 2004 the idea was that they are two different businesses have different characteristics shareholders have different demand and then we thought that we would say only 2019 finally we could get the exit and that's go forward which is a very successful sort of business and they used that name for a year after we to be exited the business the software factories you set up in the 90s essentially got demerged in 2004 as nit technology yes it was then consulting practice but also mostly it was software development mostly offshore that was our interest okay we we pushed the software factory idea quite a bit in the early in the 90s so in late 90s we had made a software division we call it nit technologies a division of and 2004 we demerged it listed it so they became two listed companies but nit held on to 25% which it exited so that the, the the passion and the love for for learning and education has kept us where it is which is why we have a foundation which has trained 6 million people since 2004 and a university which is formed in 2009 those are not for profits that's much more a, a, a passion to to do the learning agenda for different communities so for us these word b to b b to c today if you have to enter the business you have to be far clearer because it's you know people are experimenting with will i get customers or not with big bunny right our approach always was that you have to taste the ground and look for adjacencies and then keep exiting and entering depending on what the needs are so to us the word sustainability has been important and and that's something we can talk about most of your diversifications were as a result of listening to customers based on which you started tell me about nis what led to the birth of nis and why did you eventually shut that so nis nis was basically again we were looking at diversification in the 90s itself and we thought that okay another concrete skill which this country disrespects but it will need as liberalization happens is professional selling because we the whole idea of salesman hai, was something which was antithetical so we said we should professionalize this because that's how it is all over the world we would see professional salesman who retire as professional salesman they have big houses they have everything else they love to do that and this idea of us was so we said let's get into it but then late 90s became such a busy time for it itself and that was largely largely we found that that there there were companies which were very interested for us to do stuff so we'll talk about that we but that's that's and then we found that there was one customer who was our biggest customer and that was reliance and so the person we had we had a person who had joined us to set up this business and we thought that he should get an exit and so then we had a chat with a very good chat with the found with big people with okesh ambani actually and he was very interested so we exited that because the whole team then because they were the huge, they were expanding that time like crazy like they are and so we exited that business because we we felt that that's not something which will get our attention with this booming of of it so that exit was done because we had a good home for that place and something which would give them growth and our people there would were happy to get that situation you could make a plan about achieving certain either capability or market access and then you would possibly make some sort of a calculation that okay instead of spending a year or two on building this in house i'm okay to spend 10 million dollars to acquire this company what is the way in which that calculation happens that how much you are willing to spend to acquire that capability instead of building it organically well see building new methods and practices takes many years so very often it's not a complicated calculation of 10 years will take so long we used to do those mathematics earlier then we realize that if someone has a distinct competence which we are missing it has to be a reasonable deal it is not this ed tech kind of valuation which are unrealistic 
many of our we haven't gone into any of those by the way and neither do we intend now post the, the challenge that they have things will be reasonable and we'll obviously look at them more seriously because that's a different engine there the economics is never an issue it's just perception of opportunity we've never done based on that so we've seen what do people have and how, how does it fit in does it give a leverage internally then we build a whole logic of saying okay what's the rationale how will we convince our investment committee and our board that you this is what we spend in acquisition and this is what return will give on its own and then we look at you know okay what else can be leveraged that's on top of it so the economics is done more around if we do this investment what does it do to our capability which gets translated into revenue and profitability and uh, nit technologies nis so nis we had started that business in the early 90s and then it was it was a very interesting business i think it still is something we should do at some point because our recognition was that sales is not a respected role or salesman hai, you know people getting bags but we knew that as india you know as it as the markets mature professional selling will be in demand so we started that it was doing well but then late toward the end of the 90s early part of the decade next decade we were so busy with technology right and consuming and we had one customer who had was such an overriding the large customer that you know the there was a decision that it may make sense for us to divest that and put our energies elsewhere so it was much less to do with values and funding it was reasonably good return but the bigger issue was that we are getting more focus on technology with all, all new technology areas and therefore this would be something which someone else can do justice to and it tech of course as i as i recalled when i told you about the history we started training then we started consulting and then got us into software business and we we prided ourselves on having this model of which is called the hospital and medical college model which is the the the, the doctors practice and the bright ones do research and create new knowledge and you teach people the practical way as you see in doctors and interns going around it's a very integrated model of learning so for us that was a very important contribution in the first two decades of the people doing software also doing training then we make divisions over a period of time then it gets a little separated but there's a common common development facility so the the work is being done in the field for clients and that actually gets translated into cases and knowledge and so on and when we listed that time 90s was a great time everything was going well financials were running similarly but there were set of our investors who were more focused and interested in education they were typically the more long term bet pension funds and stuff and then there was those who were looking at soft software as a high growth risk embracing area and, and so they were keen to see that we you know they understood part of the business and less very focused on businesses and so we start giving them separate breakouts financial numbers and then towards the end of the 90s both companies had become a certain size and there was then a discussion that now should be and they're big enough and they both have their own capabilities across the board and therefore should we not look at first of all two different listed companies but when we went for listing 2003 or 2004 i think markets were not very right but we had decided to move ahead and so we what we did is we demerged the software division and listed that while nit held on to 25% so they became two listed companies with two boards but no common promoters and both ran quite well independently and then we thought that it was time to now for, for us to focus on education which needed that time much more funding and growth and then markets were not very right at that time 2008 again we were ready but markets were not right and then 2012 and finally after starting a search in 2019 we found a good equation to make sure that we had a team the whole team went along there and and as i mentioned they're doing exceptionally well as coforge and so therefore nit limited in a sense stays with the business that it started with okay interesting so uh, coming to the topic of people uh, nit currently has about 3 3 and a half thousand kind of a head count i want to understand how does one organize and you know build such a large people organization you know and i'm sure it it would have evolved over the years in terms of how you organize it and you know are there like functional divisions or are there like sbu strategic business units and each business unit has all the functions within it and i want to understand that a little bit more so let me say in 42 years we've tried every every model there is in the book okay every model so we started as a monolithic entity in fact i remember presenting a paper somewhere 20 years ago so i called it ede that is everybody does everything that's the first phase okay and then from there you organize into functional areas 
first thing that happens, you've got marketing, you've got sales, you've got delivery, you've got everything. And then when the complexity starts growing, complexity, not in a negative way, one is newer markets. So you want to do a geographical distribution. And then there's a complexity in terms of product lines, as I said, you know, even software and education for us. So then we, we went, in fact, through a strategic business with divisional structure that you have this business, that business, that business has some functions which are its own staff function, but maybe finance is common, but you have a controller in each. So you give a little more independence to each line of business in the head of the business to run the P&L. Then you realize that you're becoming bigger. There are too many overheads. So you go into a matrix structure. So matrix is basically well, all of HR, all of all of, all the staff functions, and then all the, you may have a geography matrix. You may say US is one geography it has. So you may have geographies and businesses. So matrix structure actually is what many companies went through at one point, but matrix is very difficult to manage because there's too much of contention to deal with. So, so th- just an example to understand the matrix structure better. For example, an HR manager would have one reporting to a CHRO and another reporting to a business head where he's the HR manager for. Like That, that would be a matrix structure. As an example, as an example, we'll have a geography. Geography has all profit leaders or lines of business. And then the lines of business, and there's someone sitting here responsible for a product across geographies. So many companies still do that very well. Many European companies do that well. But the thing is that has huge amount of complexity. So for high growth companies, for high growth companies, it gets in the way of growth. For companies growing at 3 to 4% per year, real, real growth, very, very large companies, sometimes that can work well. But even their companies have changed after too much. My, my view is to, when you have a structure for too long, some habits of the structure, bad habits accumulate. Then some chief executive comes and says, this is not working well. Now let me just make it divisional again or make me different companies again. So, so here again, I would say that structure follows strategy, not the other way around. Structure follows strategy. So if your strategy is that you are going to go have geographical expansion, if you're saying next five or 10 years, that's our game. So then we also, when we started 91, we said, first we called it exports. Okay. Then we say, no, no, no. It's now we have to do internationalization. That means you have, instead of you have guys flying to and fro, you have a US office, a Singapore office, and you're going international. And then our measures used to be that, okay, now, in this country, let's get a local chief executive or what percentage of people are local. That's an internationalization strategy. And then from there, you go into globalization. That is not that there's a center and then geographies. So if your R&D center somewhere, your production somewhere, your sales is distributed, then you are a global organization. So these phases as well, and different companies call it differently. But for us, we went through exports and then internationalization and then globalization. Is there a formal way to do strategy, uh, you know, at 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 a large organization like NIIT, you know, I can understand for a small organization, it's the founder thinking and brainstorming with a few close associates. But how does it happen in a... No, 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 no. It, that's not necessary. For example, we've always believed in deep and wide engagement of the planning process, even from the earlier days. So we'll get the top 10 people together, think of an approach. Then those 10 go back to their locations or geographies or regions. Or, and then they deploy it all the way down. This is what we are thinking of. We want your views. Then the aggregation is bottom up. That has been our approach. So what that does is it gets many more people to buy into the idea. So so we used to have what we used to call at one time the blue blue sky vision exercise, which would be maybe the t- top fifty people coming together for three days to Delhi, and then everybody doing their you know the product managers, the product line, everybody dreaming their dreams. And the regional guys are dreaming, dreaming their own dreams. We also want this. And then you have this blue sky vision. Then you aggregate it into something. Say, okay, now, if this is the overall picture, now we want you to go and go test your ideas and see what your people have to say. And then the budget would be com- coming bottom up on what they can do with such a plan. And then we seal it into a three-year direction and a one-year plan. So, But there are very many methods. Strategy, strategy is a broad question. And in strategy also isn't that the lowest man determines strategy. Strategy ultimately is a set of choices. So, but everyone should be involved in creating options and choices so they have a say in the decision. And that's why you have a financial strategy sometimes. Okay, will we raise funds? Will we go public? You have a technology strategy. Will we buy or will we invent? So then there are these subsections within that. What is the NIT method? How how do you, what model do you use currently? We, As I said, we, it, it sort of, our rhythm is that around October we'll start a perspective planning workshop where, where the business leaders present to the board their views and 
you know, what's happening and what's competition doing and what are the opportunities. And the board, increasingly a board has become a board that challenges the executives, say, okay, why this, why not that? Then sometimes we'll take the board to an offsite. So this last year, the board went to our international customer meeting in the U.S. and came back very enlightened about what's happening because there we work with the Fortune 100. So then they will start posing questions. So the, so the board challenges these groups. Then they have to go back, modify, go back to the next level, work through the plan, come back again for the second round, which will happen for us end of this month. And so that's revisiting the perspective plan, focus, and then putting some, looking at the goals and aspirations, and then challenging them if they're good enough or this is, looks unrealistic. So there's a moderation and a challenging process by the board. And then that guideline is used to make the budget in the next month, so that by end of February, early March, the plan for next year is set and broken into quarters and so on and so forth. So, and yet every board meeting we do sometime, to, if some board member says this is happening, what are we doing about it? Or some large thing happens in the markets. Okay. So for the last couple of quarters, it's about saying, okay, if there's such a funding winter, there's a, it's an opportune, opportune time to look at some good assets in the tech space now. But we've been looking because ever since we divested, we've been looking for assets. So this now gives a flavor. So things are more dynamic. The old long-term horizons are not the thing of the moment. I mean, one is we are not looking beyond three years. And now then within that, we have to start looking at how will this risk emerge? What will happen in China? What will happen in the US? What will happen? What did Brexit mean? You know, those questions come into conversation to inform the process so that everybody's realistic. So at what stage should a startup think about building a strong board? How how early should they start thinking about? Conceptually, before you start the company. Conceptually, you need some good sound, they call sounding boards, okay, it's not boards. But you better not venture in completely hip shooting on a white stallion out of the blue. And that's not my style. Many people do that. But it's good to have wise counsel. So people not like you, people who don't think like you, people who challenge you. Idea is challenging. They'll say, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? But this happened there, that happened there. Something you should have asked yourself, you don't want to make sure you're not missing. So a sounding board is desirable in any case. In the current format, the guy who invests becomes a board member and sometimes is good and sometimes not so good. Particularly when people who are funding you have short horizons, then your alignment is to build a company. So you have to see that there's enough people in the board or in the team who share the long-term vision with you rather than a short-term vision. Because this question comes up very often. And uh, therefore, people who have a view, people who are knowledgeable, people who can be changing, then of course, now you do need, your board will have to have strong people on finance. Who, the chair of the finance committee can't just be anybody. There is a choice. So you don't put committees early on. You have a board, but individuals who have expertise in various areas. And some of them may be friends who have known you and who know your strengths and weaknesses. And you're not to praise you all the time. You get them on the board or bum chums from college. That's never useful. But people who have some capability which your your team needs to be challenged on and therefore superior knowledge. And then you need a very conscientious set of board members who will keep you honest because my view on corporate governance is that, you know, any decision you take, this whole ideal of a widow who has one share in your company, what will it do to her? So, so not that that's a written thing, but that's the... That's the sensitivity, the minority shareholder. But that becomes more important when you go for listing. That's a big, big difference when you go for listing and we can go into that question about IPO. But initially, you make a, a sounding board for the first few years. I mean, in our time, we had more time. Now, people are quite busy to get funding and then quite busy to do listing. So, it, the time is getting compressed. So, in the early phase, sounding board, then a good a board of people who can challenge you and Obviously, those who fund will be there, but you should take people. If you have technology, then someone who's really smarter than your senior most people or has a vision of technology, very important. If you're going to be consumer market, then someone who understands that better than you guys do. So you see your deficiencies, basically. And then when you're going towards listing, then there are many stipulations. You know, the independence is a very important. You can't get on board only those people who have been with you all along because they're already aligned to your ideas and they may have missing links. So then getting independent directors actually is a knack and non-executive independent directors because you have your executive directors and then there are many ratios assigned to how many you can have and of this and how many you can have independent and so on. So then the choice really is that you want corporate governance to be a very important thing. You want risk assessment to be very important. Because if you look at the very large companies, the big thing is risk. Because even an opportunity is a risk. You have to see, take a risk view. Okay, what should we be doing if Ukraine something happens? Risk. So risk assessment and risk management is now also these are becoming statutory things. So then your thing is much more about the board 
not being the people who conceive products and drive businesses. The board is a, once again a board that challenges management. So you have to devolve the power. So you have to board has to look at the talent. It's a very, it's a very important role of the board. There's a committee for that. Nominations of administration committee that looks at this, and uh, then you have an audit committee, and then you have done a lot. You have many functions which are helping the board to challenge management for its new ideas and helping the board to keep an eye that everything is going well. So that becomes a much more evolved and well-documented set of restrictions. You know, the, the, the impositions of from SEBI and so on actually help people to decide what kind of people they should have. But by then, I mean, in our time, we, we listed, of course, in 10 years only. Many companies were at that time doing much later, but now people try to do it even quicker. What are the benefits and disadvantages of listing? Like, you know, what has been your experience as, you know, running a listed company? So I think what the the going public pluses are, of course, you raise funds, most important. You, you raise funds and uh, the original founders get an opportunity to divest something. So they generate some wealth. They want to make the house. They want to buy a car. They want to do whatever, the hard-earned money. And then now, of course, after ESOPs came, which was much after we started, it also becomes a method to compensate at a wider level. So there's more sharing of wealth. And and you also get written about quite a bit, which get, keeps the markets informed about you, keep customers informed about you. And I tend to feel, you know, if you're a good company with good practices, then no one will talk of those practices unless you're listed. So there's a plus for that as well. But fundraising, key is fundraising, I guess. People go to the market to, to distribute the holding and to raise more funds. And it is reporting. If you call it a downside, but I think if it's if you take reporting appropriately, sometimes we feel there's a bit some some things that are a bit too much. But there's no perfection in these things. But I think doing it through a structure gives a board a responsibility to make sure that your actions are not violating the the principles underlying the requirements of governance. And and I think it keeps you in good in good shape. I think. So my last question to you: How do you drive culture down to the lowest level of the organization? So the simple answer is one person at a time. First of all, let's be clear. Okay, one each person is unique. Are you focused around each individual or not? So if we have said from day one that people's growth is our growth, then you are clearly focused on okay. If you can get each person to grow, then growth will happen. That's our belief. Which means that you are investing in them. So we have many many kind of truisms or rules of policy, but one of them is promote the person before he's ready, he or she is ready. Because then they will aspire and they will work harder and they have a lot to prove and they are making some mistakes and learning in the process. It also holds people because people know the reality. Everybody's getting a you know step up. Or that we invest, we used to, there was a period of time when we were counting the number of days of training per person that we were giving across the company. So investing, we had something called the School for Employee Education and Development called SEED very appropriately. Everybody had to go every year for X number of days. and But but that's a mechanism to engage. What do you engage them on? So you obviously have to state things you think are okay and not okay and you do it through your you know value statements. And then you also want to be able to tell people what we are up against and what we want to do. So we ritualized a thing which we call the annual day. We did it in our eighth year. And every year we do it. Earlier it was just three cities and five cities and many cities and then zones and Last few years was virtual, not half half as much fun. But those annual day ritual is an important day when we get in distributed manner, everybody to spend the day with leaders talking about what they plan to do, what they did. And it's not as much financial numbers because those are visible not to everybody quarterly. But we set out to do this. This is what we've done. This has worked well. And a lot of time is for recognition of people. Very large number, about 5 to 6 to 7% of people every year get some kind of recognition. And some accumulate and, you know, we have an excellence award. Third time you get it, we call you an accelerator. And then if you get it a couple of more times, you become unstoppable. So there's a whole thing. And people aspire for all kinds of things. And it's a recognition among peers. Very important. Qualities are identified, amplified, and talked about as being examples. But what I found is that culture, while all of this happens, you know, if you've stated your culture on a piece of paper as values and mission and beliefs, the one thing that works is how you are tested when you have a violation, okay? And it's amazing how quickly everybody gets to know this, okay? Someone didn't treat someone well. And we don't make a public issue of caning people or whatever, but we take it very seriously. And so people know that such things are not allowed. Fortunately, not too many, but such things are not allowed. Or upholding something broke our back. We say, okay, we had to do it. We did it. So, and it's all done with integrity because bright people know what's real and not real. So, 
so whenever there's any any violation of any aspect of the culture it's how management behaves how swiftly they behave that actually codifies and hard codes the culture